And Beat bullies his way inside. Out to Harden for the three. Got it! <laughs> all right so those of y'all which is probably most of y'all who watched the last video remember that i opened it describing my on again off again semi open relationship with music since like adolescence and by open what i really mean is giving myself the freedom to dip and try something else when I got bored, but also leaving myself with the option to come back to my anchor once I realized that the green grass on the other side of the fence was really just astroturf the whole time. I mean, I don't know why y'all looking at me like that. That describes like half of y'all's love lives. Anyway, what y'all also have probably figured out by now is my taste are in a word, eclectic. Some might even say erratic even but some would also say that Thomas Sal is reputable. What I'm saying is that some people are a little weak in the upper story, if you get what I'm saying. The point I'm getting at is my taste and musical influences are all over the place, just like Future's kids. And late in my 10 years, while in the midst of my internalized anti-blackness phase of music snobbery, I discovered Guitar Hero. And through that game, I discovered one of the handful of tracks I can say literally changed my life. Like, listen to this, guys. Like, doesn't it make you want to get off the computer and go down to your local municipal center and apply for a permit to conduct a peaceful protest with a pre-designated start stop time itinerary participant cap and a location close enough to the biggest center of population to be seen but also far enough away to not actually disrupt anything that's going on there I know that was meant to be a joke, but based on the way that some of y'all understand politics, even that is asking a little too much. But anyway, thanks to Guitar Hero, I discovered the Dead Kennedys and the hardcore genre they're associated with. A genre that I have largely eschewed until then because, I mean, well, yeah, these niggas. See, I, like a lot of black folks actually, was under the false impression that punk and hardcore, and for that matter, metal, even though that's a completely different topic, are white music for a white audience. Matter of fact, that's the reason I never joined a proper band. I wanted to play punk, or at least something punk adjacent, like the White Stripes or the Red Hot Chili Peppers. But I didn't want to be in a band with white boys. And I'm sorry if that sounds racist, but I've seen how y'all act when you get drunk. And based on that, I genuinely don't know why the prison population is still disproportionately colored. Well, I mean, I, I do know, but that's neither here nor there. The point is I never had any interest in being a solo act. I wanted to be in a band, but in a band with black people but by the time i thought i was good enough to be in an actual band i was already in college one whose student body was approximately 10 percent black which is why i wound up transferring to one that was approximately 15 percent black yeah y'all think that's a joke but that five percent mattered enough that my new school had harry belafonte come as a speaker one time and also an afro-american studies department without which Y'all wouldn't be getting these videos, so the debt was kind of worth it in the end, I suppose. Anyway, I was knee-deep into my bleeding heart liberal phase by my early 20s, but unlike the talking heads over at TYT and MSNBC, I was actually sincere about it. Point being, I was too busy trying to save the world to bother myself with something as trivial as making art. And now a full decade later, I'm right back where I was when I was 19. Insert whatever punchline you want here. I really don't got one. It's that depressing. Anyway, what I want to do with this video is dispel the idea that punk and its plethora of subdivisions is somehow white boy music. 
And in fact, show y'all who don't already know that the history of punk rock is as black as gender war discourse, but with the added benefit of not being completely worthless. So despite what folks may protest, no one is really sure when or where punk rock actually started. But we do have a much clearer picture of how and why it started. As far back as the British Invasion, aka white boy blues bands, acts like the Stones, the Who, and the Kinks especially found success with a stripped down riff heavy sound that can be heard in tracks like My Generation, Satisfaction, and probably the only two songs you've ever heard of by the Kinks if you're not old enough for palliative care yet. Those being You Really Got Me and All Day and All of the Night. Well, by the late 60s, Seattle and Detroit especially became home to scenes that had not only embraced the stripped down sound of the British bands I mentioned earlier, but deconstructed it even more to the point of it sounding almost primal. So think like what Fresh and Fit did with the Kevin Samuels formula, but with music and far less embarrassing. This era gave birth to bands like the Kingsmen in the Pacific Northwest, who actually released their single Louie Louie, which a lot of people look at as proto-punk ground zero, two years before my generation came out. And also we can't forget about Michigan's MC5 and the Stooges. Now, here is where things start to get murkier than Doja Cat's blackness. Depending on who you ask, and more than likely their country of origin, they'll tell you punk rock became distinctly punk rock in either New York or London, with the stateside stands citing bands like the Velvet Underground, the New York Dolls, and of course the Ramones, while the UK audience points to the Clash, and for all of the normies in the audience, Sex Pistols, aka history's first boy band. Fight Me. Now, punk, like all art forms, is an expression of the attitudes and experiences of the people who created it. And thus, the general consensus has typically been that the roots of punk rock lie in the angst experienced by white working class youths in the urban jungles of 1970s London and New York. And if you don't know anything about life in 70s New York City, it was hell, basically. And that's true for pretty much any urban center during that decade with more than like 50,000 people. The point I'm getting at is the aggression of early punk rock was a reflection of the environment its artists lived in. <laughs> much like hip hop, honestly. But it was also a response to what urban youth perceived as the excess of bands like one of the greatest of all time, Queen, and also Led Zeppelin, AKA history's most popular cover band. Again, fight to me. What I'm saying is punk both musically and aesthetically was meant to be anti-establishment. Thus, many if not most of the first wave and even more of the second wave of punk acts expressing left-leaning if not outright leftist themes in their music. Case in point, nearly all of the Clash's catalog and Sex Pistols' best and most well-known single literally being titled Anarchy. Unfortunately, just like a lot of working class youths who find a way to stumble into the privilege they were once denied, in their later years, punk pioneers Johnny Ramone and especially John Lydon revealed that they were never really as anti-establishment as their music made them out to be. They just wanted access to that privilege that I mentioned earlier and were just, I guess, having an extended hissy fit about not having it. Considering conservatives' obsession with blue-haired feminazis, this is either peak hypocrisy or minimal self-awareness. Or both, knowing these two. Now, the issue here, at least on the UK side, is that many of the early punks weren't actually working class, believe it or not. A lot of them actually picked up their aesthetic and possibly even politics from art school. Joe Strummer's dad was actually a pretty well-paid government bureaucrat, so the working class connection, at least when it comes to the actual bands themselves, isn't exactly crystal clear, just like the age of Matt Walsh's mistress. Now... All that being said, while the general consensus is that punk became punk in either New York or London around like 76 or 77-ish, 
Around five years earlier, in Detroit no less, another outfit was cultivating a sound somewhere between MC5 and the Ramones. It might just be the world's first punk rock band. A band of brothers, no less. You know, because they're black, but they're also literally blood brothers. Screw it, Clarence. Just cut to the title card. In 1971, brothers David, Dennis, and Bobby Hackney formed the band Rockfire Funk Express and were basically just that, something in between Hendrix and his Electric Ladyland era and Parliament Funkadelic. However, sometime in 1974, two things happened that would alter the course of both the band and rock music's history. In that year, eldest brother David went to an Alice Cooper show, and instead of doing the sensible thing and running home to bathe himself in holy water, he convinced the younger Hackney brothers to switch to a distinctly hard rock sound. This was also the year that the Hackney family patriarch died, and David being David, convinced his younger brothers to change the band name from Rock Fire Funk Express to Death believing they could spin the meaning of the word into something more positive. Thus, death was born. Nice turn of phrase if I do say so myself. And they didn't really make a whole lot of noise outside of what they created with their instruments. I mean, again, this is a punk rock band from East Detroit in a time in which Motown, despite no longer being at its peak, was still the sound most black audiences wanted to hear and most black bands were emulating. We didn't fit in at all. The rock bands we identified with, we didn't hang out with those guys. We were in the inner city on the east side in the black community. Most of the bands were doing stuff like Al Green, Earth, Wind & Fire, the Isley Brothers. Being in the black community and having a rock band People just looked at us like we was weird. After we got done with a song, instead of cheering and clapping, people would just be looking at us. Still, despite their struggle to drum up a buzz in community, the band had enough potential to catch the ear of Clive Davis. Yeah, that Clive Davis, who, according to the Hackney family, funded recording sessions for seven of a planned 12 songs in 1975. But Billiam! You may be wondering as you lick the Cheeto dust from your sausage fingers, whatever happened to those other five songs? Well, I'm glad you asked, bucko, because remember how I said a year earlier the band had changed their name to turn a negative event into a positive thing? Well, Clyde, being a music exec after all, wasn't exactly feeling the symbolism and figured audiences wouldn't either. So he insisted that the band change their name if they wanted his backing, to which David being David told Clive to go take a long walk off of a short pier and into the gaping maw of a baby kraken. So because brothers, despite their reservations, Bobby and Dennis bat David and thus the band lost their lifeline and wound up self-releasing a single single from those sessions. That being politicians in my eyes with the B-side of Keep On Knocking in 1977. So yeah, two whole years after recording and a year after the Ramon self-titled debut. What's worse is they only managed to push a paltry 500 units of that single. I mean, considering this was the 70s after all, maybe they should have hooked up with Eddie Jackson for a BOGO promo. Get two hits for the price of one if you know what I mean you know Eddie Jackson the big time drug dealer yeah one of these days y'all are gonna realize that I don't really make jokes for white people anyway not long after the singles release death as they were were no more the brothers relocated to Vermont and released two gospel albums under the name the fourth movement and thus Death went from being the proto-punk equivalent of XXL's freshman class of 75 to a legend in punk rock circles, even a rumor to those outside of the collective circuit. The black punks before the Ramones and the Clash were largely lost to history. Or they would have been, if not for that aforementioned collective circuit. See, the seven-inch vinyl press of politicians in my eyes was, like I said, a 
pretty hot commodity because of both its scarcity and the story behind it. Eventually sometime in the late aughts, which coincidentally is right when I started getting into bands like the DKs and Black Flag, MP3s were made of the two song vinyl press. These MP3s made their way to a publication called Chunklet Magazine, which is basically kind of like a bootleg mad or crack after all the good writers left. Well, somebody from the New York Times evidently had run out of politics to publish, so they came across the Chunklet article and decided to further investigate the legend of the black punks who predated punk. Around the same time, Bobby Hackney's son Julian heard the single being played at a party in San Francisco and immediately recognized his father's voice. He then told his brother Bobby Jr., who after discovering the single's legendary status, formed a tribute band with friends to help spearhead his dad and uncle's flower bestowment campaign. They named the band Rough Francis in honor of David, who was considered the visionary of the group, and this was his alternate musical ego. David, unfortunately, didn't live to see the band's rediscovery as he struggled with alcoholism and died of lung cancer. That being said, according to family, David always knew that somehow, some way, death was going to have its day. And by golly G. Willikers, that day did come when the campaign started by Bobby Jr. and the article written by the New York Times led to Drag City Records reaching out to the surviving Hackney Brothers about potentially releasing all seven tracks recorded during those 75 sessions in the form of an album that would become 2009's For the Whole World to See. This along with that Times article led to the 2012 documentary A Band Called Death which is actually how I discovered them in the first place and thus we have our happy if somewhat bittersweet ending. But like jokes aside this is one of my favorite stories and not just rock music but just music history period. It's right up there with Prince spending like a decade making the weirdest stuff he possibly could just because he could after that decade long divorce from Warner Brothers. And of course Frank Ocean somehow finessing Def Jam out of 20 million dollars aka the heist of the century. It's because it's a feel good story in an industry where every other day black Twitter turns whatever click clout headline the rap blog brigade turns out into its newest gender word proxy like i swear some of y'all act like you've been out of work so long you think that ebt is a bank i mean just think about how differently we would tell the story of not just punk but rock music period had death been given their due in their heyday well i mean considering that both elvis and the beatles became the most popular rock acts of all time by literally just whitewashing what were already pretty well-known race records i'd say not much but my point is in a world in which every halfway competent musician or better yet not so competent tweet decker is chomping at the bit to sell their souls to the industry and then make a whole song about it like some sort of half-hearted protest against it how positively punk is it that these three brothers turned down what may well have been a chance of a lifetime to be spoken of in the same breath and with the same reverence as bands like the Stooges and MC5 because doing so would have compromised their ideals. I mean, a lot more than being a washed up industry plant caping for Pierce Morgan, I'll tell you that much. Again, fight me. So that's the story of death in a nutshell, which I know that y'all know I was going to cover because like every other comment I got on that blue eyed soul video was some version of, Hey, Billiam, did you hear about the black punk band from Detroit called death? Yes. Yes. I know about them. Shut up and give me a second to research for Christ's sake. But the history doesn't stop there folks. And I'm kind of halfway surprised that the next band I'm going to talk about didn't get brought up as much because if death were towing the line between punk and whatever I guess people thought that sound was before the Ramones, these next guys were 10 toes down into the punk rock deep end. And if you ask me or anyone for that matter, actually filled it up in the first place. Song called Noise Addiction. 
One, two, three, four. Around the same time that Death had recorded the seven tracks that would become for the whole world to see, punk rock was establishing an identity in the Big Apple that was distinct from the proto-progenitors of the Spartan state, thanks in large part to the Ramones, but also the Velvet Underground, who actually formed only two years after MC5, and two years before the Stooges. That's that whole no one really knows when or where speech that I gave earlier. Also, the New York Dolls, television, Patti Smith, etc. and so forth. But in the midst of all of this, in literally the same month that Smith and television began their two-month residencies at the legendary CBGB club, another black band came up the I-95 corridor and set the New York punk scene ablaze. No, like, literally, they played so loud that they set their amps on fire one time. Like, y'all should know by now that every other thing that I say has a double meaning. West Philly's pure hell, yeah. Philly actually has given a lot more to the music world than just Meek Mill and the Fresh Prince theme for the record. We're distinctly punk if death wasn't quite there. Both musically and aesthetically, they were exactly what you'd imagine a bully from an early 90s cartoon would be. They integrated their love of Hendrix, Cooper, Bowie, and the burgeoning punk rock scene from up north to create a sound that has retroactively been dubbed proto-hardcore. And along with the New York Dolls, who they'd later befriend, established the aesthetic for what would later be called glam rock. And yeah, if you're starting to get the ick that proto when applied to black people is just kind of a backhanded way of saying, yeah, y'all probably did it first, but we just don't want to acknowledge that. That's because it kind of is. Anyway, in much the same way that Hendrix did to the white boy blues scene when he arrived in London in what, like 64, I don't remember. Pure Hell blew away the New York punk scene with their aggressive and high energy sound and presence even by punk standards i mean these are philly niggas after all and despite most of the new york punk scene reacting in much the same way that clapton did when he met hendrix pure hell found at least one ally in the dolls who themselves were kind of on the outs in punk rock circles because of their nose candy habit that on top of just how competitive the punk scene was at the time and just the novelty of them being the only black band of prominence in that scene meant that they just had to go that much harder to be taken seriously. An American tradition. Despite the adversity, Pure Hell, through their relationship with the Dolls, were able to land gigs at several prominent clubs, as well as features in publications like Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine. Eventually, the band drummed up enough buzz to attract the attention of Curtis Knight, who actually fronted Hendrix's first band, The Squires. Or, actually, they literally just showed up on his doorstep one day after reading the biography that Knight wrote about Hendrix. Again, <laughs> Philly niggas. Knight and his then wife Kathy were so enthused with the band that they sacrificed three months rent the finance studio time for Pure Hell, which resulted in their cover of These Boots Were Made For Walking," which reached the top five of the UK alternative charts. They also booked Pure Hell's 1978 European tour, which actually came just in time, as not soon after the tour was booked, the band opened for Sid Vicious's last public appearance before the infamous murder of his then-girlfriend, Nancy Spurgeon. Like I keep saying, but <laughs> these guys. So, Pure Hell, who were already struggling to drum up a buzz stateside, got caught up in this cluster as every tabloid and magazine were only interested in covering them so much as their association with Vicious. Despite this, the band's European tour was by all accounts a success, if largely due to Knight deftly playing the race card to stir up curiosity within the British music press. Like, seriously, the way they were billed made them look more like a minstrel act than an honest-to-God band. Which means that they would fit right in with these guys. I said to Curtis, why do you have to call us a black band? Of course, that's what we were, but we didn't really think in those terms at the time. People in Europe were curious about the band before we even arrived. They were looking at it like a novelty. 
they didn't believe we really existed. Despite their reservations, the boys from West Philly were able to leverage their novelty into legit success and found themselves firmly entrenched in the London punk scene by the time the tour had ended. This, in a lot of ways, was a blessing in disguise as the UK punk scene was generally more convicted in its political leanings and thus not nearly as racist as the American one and was already beginning to integrate reggae and ska into their sounds, thus creating a much more cordial environment for Pure Hell to cultivate their sound. Despite this and their increasing notoriety, at least in community, the band continuously saw themselves passed over by record labels for white acts because, you guessed it, they were Negro. Labels insisted that the band change their sound to Motown and like death before them told those labels to kindly swallow a broken glass dildo. And as you'd expect, Pure Hell never received the commercial or critical flowers their contemporaries did despite, you know, pioneering a whole subgenre. To add insult to injury after a fallout over a number of things, Night quit as the band's manager and returned to the States in 1979, taking the band's masters with him, leaving them stranded in Europe in what can only be described as the worst gap year ever. But the band did manage to find a way back to the States that same year and managed to submit themselves as mainstays in the LA punk scene. And yeah, that was pretty much it for pure hell who would have known that name would perfectly describe their professional peak. But yeah, with no manager, no masters, and most importantly, no major record deal, Pure Hell just kind of faded as the hardcore scene really began to come into its own with groups like the DKs, Black Flag, and Bad Brains leading the charge. Now, in recent years, there's been kind of a mini campaign to give Pure Hell the recognition they were robbed of when they believed they should have gotten it, and rightfully so, by the way, but nothing to the extent of death, who themselves are nowhere near as revered as Bad Brains. And that's honestly kind of sad, considering that unlike death before them, there is a clear path from pure hell directly to the hardcore sound that would define punk throughout the late 70s and into the 80s and thereby the thrash metal scene of the 80s and early 90s <laughs> and thereby the grunge era and the post grunge era and the garage rock revival of the early aughts you see where I'm going with this right and all of this is, again, not to mention the glam aesthetic used by basically every band that mattered in the 80s until GNR. And listen, like I said before, I know there are probably going to be at least a handful of music snobs chirping in the comments about who came first and why, but that's not really my point. My point is to highlight how the whitewashing of punk is just another example of how dirty black artists have been done over the decades, not just by the times, but by folks who fancy themselves music historians like seriously go listen to a pure hell song and tell me who else was doing that in 1975 people incorrectly view punk as this angry white urban male genre black culture is really the source of punk and a lot of people don't recognize it or don't want to recognize it <laughs> So now we come to the coup de grace. Bad Brains is probably the first group that comes to mind when you think black punk, and deservedly so, as their fingerprints can be heard in the sounds of basically every hard rock outfit from the 80s on. Thus, Rolling Stone once calling them the mother of all black rock bands. Even though if you want to be technical, the mother of all rock bands, period, is Big Mama Thornton, but this ain't that video. This also completely disregards death and pure hell that I mentioned earlier but this is Rolling Stone that we're talking about the same publication that named Lana Del Rey as one of the greatest songwriters of all time well, I mean when you look at this it makes sense right Mind Power was formed in DC in 1976 as a jazz fusion band by Gary Dr. No Miller Daryl Jennifer and the brothers Hudson Earl and Paul, aka HR, 
A year later, Sid McRae, a friend of the band, introduced them to the Dead Boys, thus prompting Mind Power to change both its sound and name from jazz to hardcore, and from Mind Power to Bad Brains. Not long after the band underwent two more important changes that would define their sound and legacy, those being incorporating reggae sounds inspired by their affinity for Bob Marley and HR switching from guitar to lead vocals upon McCray's departure. Throughout the late 70s, Bad Brains gained a dedicated fan base thanks to their eclectic hardcore sound and high energy shows, but in the process developed a reputation for the destructiveness of those shows. Thus, every club in the area pretty much blackballing them, and they being, wait for it, banned in DC. And considering that the DC punk scene was virtually non-existent in the late 70s, it was kind of a blessing in disguise. I've seen great shows. The Pretenders, the Rolling Stones in their day, Led Zeppelin during their first American tour was a great show. But this show was even higher energy than that. I went backstage. I said, you fucking guys were just unbelievable. I went home. I didn't think I'd hear any more about it. So, in the early 80s, they relocated to New York City and became a staple of the legendary punk club CBGB, where according to Dr. No, they pioneered the club's famous Sunday matinee format. BB's self-titled debut was released in 1982, and it contained such seminal hardcore classics as Sailing On, Band in DC, Pay to Come, Leaving Babylon, pretty much the whole record if we going to be honest. If you've ever listened to Fishbone, 311, Sublime, etc., this album, or <laughs> cassette rather, is a big part of why you did, as in addition to the ska revival happening in the UK during the same time, BB's amalgamation of reggae and hardcore are the main influences in those band's sounds. By the time the band's third album, Eye Against Eye, released in 1986, BB had developed a more complex sound, integrating along with the punk slash reggae sound of before, funk, soul, and metal. The influence of Eye Against Eye can be heard in acts ranging from the Beastie Boys, yuck, to the Red Hot Chili Peppers, yay, to the Roots, to Rage Against the Machine, and so on. Like I said earlier, the thrash metal sound made popular by bands like Metallica and Slayer combined the complexity of new wave British metal with the speed and aggression of hardcore. My point is, if BB is not one of your favorite bands, then I can all but guarantee they're one of your favorite bands' favorite bands. That is, if you even listen to bands at all. I promise you, no matter how old you are, your parents' music is most assuredly better. I mean, unless your parents are barbs, obviously. BB, like Pure Hell and Death Before Them, kind of had a hard time securing a record deal early on, but not for the same reasons the aforementioned bands did. They did have offers from both Elektra and Island Records in the early 80s, but those deals fell through because... HR. HR is why. Evidently, HR had made a veiled threat to the talent agent during their meeting with Elektra, and he killed any talks with Island, believing they had done wrong by one of the band's biggest influences, Bob Marley. And I mean, this is a record company after all, so HR probably had a point. Either way, this marked one of several hiatuses slash breakups of the band's OG lineup that would basically characterized their run. One of the more colorful is when the band was signed by Madonna's label Maverick, and Maverick setting up a gig for them opening for longtime fans of BB, the Beastie Boys, on their 95 Arena Tour. And then HR decided to mollywop a concert goer with a mic stand who was beating his own girlfriend in the front row. I'm trying to tell you, these guys are effing legends, man. Anyway, the band couldn't make HR's bail, so that was it for BB's tenure with Maverick. Still, despite the tumult, BB had already firmly established themselves as punk rock royalty, injecting their DNA into basically every post-hardcore band that mattered until bands didn't really matter anymore. God, I hate SoundCloud. 
even as revered as Bad Brains is, the argument can be made that they're still not as celebrated as many, myself included, think that they should be. Despite everything that we went through and the rumors that you might have heard about us, every group of our level has this thing sort of going on. It's just that I really honestly believe because we're black. Not to wave any type of racial flag. I always used to say that it, if Led Zeppelin throw a TV out a window, that's rock. The bad brains smoke up a room with weed and throw bottles all over. We're like niggers. We always had a double standard. Again, considering the impact these cats have had on the music landscape, not just after, but during their peak, Bad Brains should be a household name even among casual music listeners in the same way that Metallica or Red Hot Chili Peppers or the Beastie Boys or Rage Against the Machine or any of the other bands that were directly influenced by Bad Brains are. Now, I know a lot of y'all were probably expecting a comprehensive history of black people punk rock and through the decades all the way until afro punk just became afro alternative apparently but i didn't really see a point in doing that since like i said in the earlier video all forms of popular american music is just black music again big mama thornton rather i wanted to highlight how black people have always been on the cutting edge of the genre forging the path that some of your and my faves would follow, thus rendering the punk as white music argument as a nine, as a 10, as a 11 even. See, it wasn't until the oi movement that punk became inextricable from whiteness and blacks within the culture got pushed to the back of the bus completely. I'm just firing off on all cylinders today, ain't I? If you don't know what oi is, it's, Relax. Yeah, basically it's that, but with music. So remember how I said a lot of the early British punk bands weren't actually working class despite the themes in their lyrics? Well, by like 78, 79 ish, the British punk rock proletariat was making moves to seize the power back from their petite bourgeois contemporaries and thus birthed the oi movement, which itself beget the skinhead movement and aesthetic that has now become inextricable from Nazis, despite skinheads historically being some of the most anti fascist MFs in all of music. Them. So then where did the Nazi connection come from? Well, TLDR, just like most of your favorite debate streamers, a lot of oi punks weren't really leftists so much as they saw leftism as a means to access the privilege they'd been denied by their social status. And so yeah, it's pretty much the musical equivalent to all those MCU marks who call any comic book media that doesn't feature a straight white male protagonist woke because they never actually bothered to read the source material before exposing just how terminally celibate they are to the rest of us and yeah don't worry that video is coming soon believe it or not i do have a lot more smoke in the tank even after that white left this video so yeah that's basically the reason why if you're not a punk rocker yourself the only black skinhead you've probably ever seen or heard of is jesus there's so many layers here, man. That aside, I mean, when you think about what I said earlier about where punk rock actually comes from, why wouldn't it be just as black as any other musical genre? I mean, the whole purpose of punk is rebelling against even <laughs> dismantling the establishment, which is literally what the diaspora has been at least attempting to do since it was dispersed in the first place. I mean, if you look at the history of black music, going all the way back to the work songs and spirituals of our ancestors, music has always been a form of protest for us against society's norms, its standards, and its institutions. Which is why when I think about it, it really wasn't that big of a leap for me to make the jump from hip hop to punk rock in my youth. Like I said before, my middle and high school years were the height of bling bling bars and snap music bops. 
And then by the time I was knee deep into my college career, Drake was just one co-sign away from the GOAT throne of that decade. So yeah, hip hop had at least the radio rotations lost a lot of the rebellious energy that I heard growing up in the late 90s and early aughts. So I pivoted to something that aligned more closely to my outlook and my experience. You see, what you got to understand is I was and still very much am a black working class kid. And my lens is colored by all the trappings of that sort of upbringing. So it's really not that much of a stretch for me to feel a lot more kindred energy coming from a white kid screaming about lynching his landlord than I do about some nigga talking about the pink Cadillac Escalade that he bought with 24-inch spinning rims. Do people even ride spinners anymore now that I think about it? Well, if they do, they never really should have started in the first place. That was dumb. My point is the idea of rock, but especially punk rock being white music, is reductive at best and straight up lazy at worst. Despite what I said earlier about racial tensions among the bands themselves, which I mean, let's just keep it a buck. That's what always happens whenever black folk enter into a predominantly white space and do the thing the white folks are doing better than the white folks. The punk scene, at least as far as the actual punkers themselves, has historically been pretty inclusive and not just the racial minorities either, but to women and to LGBT folk. And yeah, I know some of y'all are probably going to try to use some of Bad Brains' homophobic lyrics from the past as a gotcha, but go actually read the story behind the context for those lyrics, which I'm not going to sit here and spoon feed y'all because I am not your Uncle Remus, and then maybe it'll make a little bit more sense. All that being said, acts like Soul Glow and Breezy Supreme, who I know most of y'all, except maybe Bellamy, don't know about, are still carrying the torch for bands like Death, Pure Hell, and Bad Brains before them, for black skinheads, rude boys, and street punks alike. We just gotta keep a closer ear out for them than for whatever this garbage is that keeps getting shoved down the back of our throats. And yeah, I do realize that I have a hat on in this clip. It's like two days later and I did not feel like shaving. That's what happens when you get old. Your body begins to betray you in ways that you could have never imagined, especially cosmetically. Also, Johnny Rotten can eat a donkey dick. 